This presentation is entitled Ringmakers of Saturn. It serves as a follow-up to another talk that I've given entitled I Can't Believe I Believe That Facts and Fallacies in Physics and Astronomy. And they both are dealing with the theme of critical thinking, particularly in the science classroom. So speaking of science, time for an experiment. I'd like you to listen to three statements and mentally put your confidence on a scale with respect to that statement. The scale being zero to 100, zero being, being all doubt, no confidence, 100 being all confidence, no doubt, there's no way I could be mistaken about this. And these statements refer to me, the speaker. So what if I said I own a car? Where would you put yourself on that scale? Similarly, what if I said I own a Ferrari? And thirdly, what if I said, I own a spaceship? Where would you put yourself on the scale? And if you can quantify that, ask yourself, why did you put yourself at that particular level of confidence? And also ask yourself, what would you require to change your confidence one way or the other? Okay, so again, it's just a thought experiment to get things rolling. Speaking of spaceships though, let's get back to the topic at hand, which is this book, Ringmakers of Saturn, by Norman Bergman. He wrote this book in 1986, and the hypothesis essentially is that the rings of Saturn are being replenished by immensely large, enormously powerful extraterrestrial space vehicles. I should mention this book is available on PDF form out there on the internet. Uh, I've not read the entire thing, I must admit, but I have read, read bits and pieces, and one thing I noticed in the book dedication is that it's dedicated to all people in peaceful quest of knowledge, which is right up my alley because I'm actually very interested in how people know, or how people come to beliefs, how they arrive at beliefs. It's a study called epistemology. It's a branch of philosophy. And someone who studies epistemology is an epistemologist. An epistemologist is interested in what a particular person believes, but they're even more interested in why the person believes what they believe. And in fact, they're most interested in the methods the person has used to arrive at a belief and whether the person has scrutinized the reliability of those methods. You can almost think of it as a pyramid where the belief is at the top and it's undergirded by reasons. But the reasons are connected to the beliefs via some sort of method. And so the goal of an epistemologist is to drill down to the method a person uses in arriving at a belief and whether they have truly assessed whether that method is reliable. Okay, so to examine the epistemology of Norman Berggren, uh, I might propose a couple of questions. First of all, we would ask, what is his level of confidence in his belief? The belief being that aliens are replenishing the rings of Saturn. Could he put it on a zero to 100 scale? Would he be willing to? And if so, if he can quantify it, then what are the reasons that he would offer for his level of confidence? Now, I don't have him in studio. Uh, I've never communicated with him directly. So the best I can do is to find stuff on the internet, things that he's either written or said, uh, to try to establish what his answers might be to these questions. About your theory about the rings of Saturn and how this all came about. Okay, uh, really it's not a theory. When you get down to it, um, you see some pictures and you finally come up with a conclusion as a matter of fact. Uh, how I got started was that um, uh, in 1980, you know, Voyager 1 uh, uh, had a close encounter uh, with Saturn. And then in August of 1981, uh, Voyager 2 had a similar encounter. And that was only nine months apart. And I'd made copious notes on each one. And when I compared them, why um, there are great changes. Uh, a couple of examples are that... Uh, in the Cassini division, I guess we should explain here that there are four major rings in the ring system, A, B, C, and D. And between the A and B ring, there is a division called the Cassini division. Uh, that was supposed to be pure space. And uh, on Voyager 1, it looked like that, but on Voyager 2, it was filled with matter. 
and that came as sort of a surprise, mm -hmm. and it wasn't in the script. Uh, Notice in the interview that he he seems pretty confident. You know, he says it's not really even a theory; it's a fact. So I, you know, if I were to to interpret that and put him on the scale, he's pretty close to a hundred. It seems he seems very confident in the truth of his belief. Um, so then the next question is, what reasons might he give for being so confident? And certainly it seems that he would appeal to the imagery. Um, he spent time looking at this imagery from the Voyager 1, Voyager 2 missions, and he says that the Voyager 1 returns showed that the Cassini division was empty, and the Voyager 2 photos showed that the Cassini division was filled with stuff. And so he would point to the imagery at, in support of his belief, but he also seems to be appealing to a second belief, which is that NASA is aware of this discrepancy in the imagery and that there's some sort of a cover-up. There's some sort of a conspiracy. They're aware of it, but they're not going public with it. So it seems like that's also uh, a reason why he seems to believe that aliens are replenishing the rings of Saturn. So the next question that, could, that we could pose to Norman Bergman is, if it could be demonstrated to his satisfaction that the situation isn't exactly as he has depicted it, would he be willing to adjust his confidence level? That is, is it possible that his interpretation of the images might be mistaken? Also, is it possible that his depiction of NASA's position about the images might also be mistaken? And if it can be demonstrated as such to his satisfaction, would he be willing to change his confidence? Would that change the belief? So remember that the, the reasons undergird the belief. And if the reasons are shown to be suspect, would that change the belief? That's the big question here. And the reason why I kind of would pursue this, of course, he's not here to, to answer uh, the question, but you know, his claim was that the Voyager 1 mission flew by and NASA said there was nothing in the Cassini division. That was in November of 1980. Turns out that in December of 1980, before Voyager 2 had even reached Saturn, NASA had put out a publication. It's the ones that you see here on the left. And on page 16 of that publication, it notes that the Cassini division, of course, it was discovered in 1675. It had long been thought devoid of material. From, from Earth-based telescopes, nothing could be seen in that division. But now, all of a sudden, Voyager 1 flies by the planet and observed well-defined rings, this stuff, within the Cassini division. It was an unexpected discovery, but it was indeed a discovery, and NASA was trumpeting it. They weren't covering it up. And so, again, we asked the question, could we demonstrate, or would, would Bergeron accept um, new information about the imagery and or NASA's position on the imagery? And would that affect his confidence in the belief that he holds? The reason why the, if it could be demonstrated question is so important is it's essentially a stress test. It's testing how closely connected Bergen's belief is to the reason he has given for the belief. He's given as a reason that the, the imagery, as well as his perception of NASA's coverage of the imagery. Um, but, you know, so that's his stated reason, but is that really the reason why he believes what he believes? Because if he is present with new, presented with new information about the imagery or NASA's position, if that fails to cause him to change his level of confidence, then the imagery or NASA's position doesn't seem to be the real reason for his belief. Another way of asking that is, you know, should someone else believe it for the same reasons that he's believing it? Because it seems that his stated reason is not the real reason why he believes it. You know, if it is, if, it's, if it is indeed the imagery or NASA's position, we could go on and pursue 
talking about the imagery and what was seen when and that sort of thing. But if he's not willing to change his level of confidence, then he must be must be believing for another reason. And that the imagery is not worth debating. NASA's position is really not worth debating. There's another reason why he believes what he believes. And the problem for Bergen becomes, is he believing for a reason that he wouldn't expect others to accept? Again, Bergen's not here to answer these questions, but I would assume that the imagery would not change his confidence, which means that there is indeed another reason the imagery is not that important. There must be another reason. And so I pursued, I, I looked at some other writings to see if I could tease out another reason why he might hold this belief. And actually about a decade before the Voyager stuff from 1971, Bergen was a vacationing near Monterey, California. And he saw something strange in the sky. And he, he, he recounts this experience. Uh, he took some pictures, he used his binoculars, and he wound up with this description of what he was seeing, of a cylindrical device with azure blue flames, uh, had streamers, light yellow green streamers, that he actually called a pinch plasma. So he gets a pretty good visual, gives a pretty good visual description of whatever he was seeing. And in fact, I, I went on the internet and found a, a presentation of his uh, where he showed some of the imagery. This is a photo negative. There's the, there's the cottage on the beach. Uh, here's the beach. Here's the water. Monterey Bay, I assume. Um, and then there's some numbered, he, he kind of highlighted some spots on the slides. And um, I'm not exactly sure what he's looking at, but this is what he came up with. He came up with a model that shows the cylinder with the azure blue flame on each end and these are the streamers here how he came up with that from the, the, the pictures uh, I'm not sure um, it seems to me that he wanted to see aliens you know not only in Monterey but also he wants aliens to be creating those rings so again we're trying to drill down to the reasons why Bergeron believes what he believes, that aliens are replenishing the rings of Saturn. And in my mind, I think he's biased. Um, and this is not a pejorative use of the term. It's just a recognition that he has certain prejudices that cause him to take in data and inter interpret them a certain way. You know, he, he saw something strange in the sky in Monterey and immediately he grabbed for the conclusion that, oh, it's aliens. Uh, he's, he sees the rings of Saturn, some, some what he perceives as oddness in the imagery that NASA provided from the Voyager flights. And he immediately reaches for the conclusion that it's aliens that are involved. And one way of showing that indeed bias is a possibility here is we could ask ourselves, what if you were living in 1871 and not 1971? And he's out on the beach in Monterey. Would he have concluded, and he saw something strange in the sky, that he couldn't explain. Would he have reached for the alien conclusion in 1871? I don't think so, but in 1971, certainly. Clearly, that, that's what he did. Um, why is that? What was the difference in the... Well, certainly he was, he was born around 1920. He was educated as a, a mechanical engineer. He worked in the aeronautics industry, uh, I believe with Lockheed and with Ames. Um, and so that gives him a bias, a prejudice into how he then took in that new information, that, 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 that data. And he concluded aliens. In 1871, he wouldn't have probably had the same education. Uh, you know, think about being born in 1920. That means he lived his adult life through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the heyday of science fiction, books, movies, uh, uh, magazines. I'm not sure if he was a big fan of that stuff, but I would perhaps guess that he was. And that then provides a bias into how he takes in new information, new data. He wants it to be true. And one way of, of kind of asking that question is, you know, if he was wrong in that belief, if he was, would he want to know about it? You know, is he really interested in what is replenishing Saturn's rings? 
Notice that, as far as I know, there's not a Ringmakers of Saturn 2 book, despite the fact that NASA, in addition to sending the flybys of the Voyager missions in 2004, put an orbiter around Saturn, the Cassini orbiter, that orbited for more than a decade, from 2004 to 2017, when it finally was crashed into the planet. Berggren styles himself as being uh, an insider, that he had he had gotten levels of security clearance above the level of the president within NASA, uh, that he had um, all kinds of awards and honors and accolades. If he was that high up in the administration, certainly he could have, and, he, and if he really thought that there were aliens flying around Saturn replenishing the rings, um, he could have gotten some experiment on that Cassini mission to look into it more. So in my mind, I don't think he really wants to know whether he's right or wrong. And he's certainly not really that interested in what, what is truly replenishing Saturn's rings. Um, so then the next question is, why? Why would someone take that position? Does he derive any benefit? Well, certainly he sold a few books, and he certainly identified an audience. There are people who also want it to be true. There are other people out there who want evidence of aliens doing stuff that's tangible and, and viewable. And he has become their champion. He is their renegade. He's the one fighting the scientific establishment as they see it. And that's got to be a big ego boost. Uh, and so those are benefits. He is driving benefits from holding the belief, whether it's true or not. And so to quote Reed Nice Wonder, um, before I drive any benefits from a belief, I want to know whether it's true or not first. Um, and my question for Bergen is, if he wasn't driving these benefits, if he wasn't selling books, if he didn't have an audience, if he didn't have a platform, if he didn't have a certain amount of notoriety, would he be as, as uh, stuck to that particular belief? Or would he be more open to new evidence or alternative explanations? Now, there's plenty of precedent for this in the history of science. Here's an example. Percival Lowell, probably best known for the Lowell Observatory and Flagstaff. He wholeheartedly believed that there were canals on Mars, evidence of a civilization, an intelligent civilization, that had crafted these systems of canals to bring water from the polar ice caps on Mars to the equatorial regions. He firmly believed this, and this is the front page of the New York Times from 1906. Professor Percival Lowell, recognized as the greatest authority on the subject. Boy, isn't that a nice ego boost. You are the greatest authority on the subject, and you are on the cover, on, on the front page of the New York Times. And he declares that there can be no doubt that living beings inhabit our neighbor world. No doubt. All certainty. No doubt. He wanted it to be true. And he used relatively bad data. You know, he, he had great telescopes, state-of-the-art telescopes for his time. But the fact that he wanted it to be true so bad affected how he took in the evidence or the data from his observations. There were plenty of other astronomers using equally good equipment at the same time who said there's no way that Lowell was seeing what he was seeing and yet they were not the ones on the cover of the New York Times so he was certainly benefiting by virtue of notoriety for holding a relatively low probability kind of belief it's worth noting at this point that both Lowell and Berggren despite the fact they have scientific training and both speak the language of science, they're really not doing scientific research here. They're not following the scientific method in coming up with the explanations they've come up with. Well, why is that? Why do I make that assertion? Uh, both Berggren and Lowell have, I, I use a rock climber analogy, they have reached for handholds based largely on their own biases and prejudices. Lowell thinks there's canals on Mars crafted by aliens. Berggren thinks that the, the rings around Saturn are being replenished by aliens. 
again, their own biases and prejudices, their wanting it to be true, has caused them to take in relatively sketchy data and come to this one particular conclusion, this one explanation for these phenomena. That's not the way science works. A scientist looks at the entire wall and looks at the different possible handholds and asks the question, which one is more likely? And the problem with Bergen and Lowell is because they did not really assess their own biases and prejudices, but rather they immediately grabbed onto one conclusion to the exclusion of any of the other possible explanations. Now they're left with that one handhold, which you know, even when it feels perhaps shaky, even if they did, uh, if some pressure was applied, they would desperately try to hold onto that one handhold by applying gum or wrapping tape around it or, or something like that, rather than changing their confidence or perhaps discarding the explanation entirely. They're not doing, they're not using the scientific method because the scientist says, what's more likely? And, and by what's more likely, that, that really, that's synonymous with what's more testable? Which of these possible explanations could we actually test? What would we require? What kind of new information would we require in order to cause a change in the confidence scale? And where Bergen and Lowell are stuck is that there's nothing they can learn or find out about their particular explanation that would cause them to go one way or the other on the confidence scale. They have posited explanations that are not testable, and ultimately those explanations have no value. I'll go back to the statements that I introduced earlier. Again, what's more likely, that I own a car or I don't own a car? What's more likely, that I own a Ferrari or that I don't own a Ferrari? What's more likely, that I own a spaceship or that I don't own a spaceship? And what would you require to change your position on any of these statements? Now, of course, the, these are pretty low, low stakes. You, know, you don't really care. You're not invested in whether I have a car or not. If I, if, I show, if I drove up in a car, you would probably increase your confidence. If I walked every day to work, you would decrease your confidence in whether I owned a car or not. You'd be very willing to change your level of confidence because you could really care less. The question is, why do we not show that same flexibility in our beliefs and our confidence when it comes to beliefs that are a little bit higher in, in stakes, those that play a part in our identity, uh, those that have to do with our social or family standing or, or our relationships. You know, why is that? Shouldn't all ideas be equivalent or be subject to equivalent questioning? So of course this talk focused on Norman Berggren and his book, The Ringmakers, Ringmakers of Saturn. But I encourage you to extend what you've learned, some of the critical thinking skills that I've modeled here, and choose a belief of your own, something that you've thought for a long time to be true, and interrogate that belief. Ask yourself, you know, what are the reasons why I believe this? Um, what methods have I used to arrive at this belief? And have I really tested the reliability of those methods? And, and answer this question. Now, as sort of an epilogue for, for those who uh, who've made it this far. I wanted to mention, again, I don't get too much into credentials, but I did notice in doing research on Norman Berggren that his credentials seem to matter a lot to those who believe in Norman Berggren. And this is just one example. You're, you're welcome to, to check out this link or any others. Just do a Google search on Norman Berggren, and you're going to find a lot of websites that trumpet Berggren's background. Uh, this particular one that I've got the, the the address here for, as titled, NASA engineer Dr. Norman Berggren warns alien UFOs are proliferating on Saturn. And the first line is, according to claims from a top Ames, NACA, NASA, and engineer, uh, Lockheed Martin, alien UFO spaceships are proliferating on Saturn's rings, etc., etc. The, uh, the article itself, in almost every paragraph, mentions his educational or work background. Well, as I started to look into it, I noted that his doctorate, Dr. Norman Berggren, uh, his doctorate is actually just an honorary one. Uh, he got it from the World University, which turns out to be an unaccredited institution that appears to be defunct since 2003. So again, those who believe 
Dr. Berggren wholeheartedly seem to put the reason why they believe that this guy is legit is because of his credentials. So the question, again, we can do the same critical thinking thing. If it could be demonstrated to, the, to those people's satisfaction that Berger may not be what he claims to be, would that change their level of confidence in Berger? Um, his, he also has a law degree, which I think he got in 1955. It turns out it was from LaSalle University Extension. No connection to LaSalle University. It was essentially it was a correspondence school type of law degree. And finally, his book, which was published in 1986, um, was a vanity publisher. He published it through Pentland Press, uh, which is a vanity publisher. He did not get a book deal. He actually had to pay to get this thing produced. Um, again, does that speak to the, the quality or perhaps the market that was out there for this type of work? Uh, possibly. So again, these are just, you know, I would usually would not poke at someone's credentials uh, apart from the fact that those who seem to be influenced by Bergeron are very, very impressed by his background. So again, this just gives hopefully those folks a little, little bit of pause using the critical thinking skills that I've introduced in this talk.